put that down their insurance card and everything. Mm. In case something happens to them, that's oh. really weird. That's really weird. Okay. So, last time, uh, we were looking, and we went into it, amphibians uh, looked a little bit about their evolution, but uh, then we started looking at characteristics, physical, uh, anatomical, physiological characteristics, and the concentration last time was on reproduction. So, when you look at the different groups, there are some distinct differences in how they accomplish their uh, reproduction. So, in the opotens, all, in, uh, all fertilization is internal, and they all have an intromittent organ. And, and I, I had to laugh because on many of the lab practicals, people were using the term an intermittent organ. So it works sometimes, but it doesn't work other times. Um, it's intromittent. All right, so. Mito is the Latin word to send, intro is into, so to send into, not to work sometimes, to send into. Uh, and the intromittent organ then is the, uh, they just evert the lower end of their cloaca. Uh, most of them are viviparous or ovoviviparous. Uh, the oviparous ones, the egg layers, do have aquatic larvae, and the others could have aquatic or they could have direct development on land where they're bypassing the uh, larval stage, the tadpole stage, and doing all their development within the egg. Salamanders, um, external fertilization is very uncommon. It's only in the Cryptobranchidae and one other family. Uh, their method of internal fertilization, though, is unique among the terrestrial vertebrates, and that is the spermatophore. Uh, the spermatophore is made by the cloacal glands and then sperm. Uh, mixes with secretions from the pelvic glands and so that it's held on top of that spermatophore. There's a courtship involved. The female then takes up that uh, secretions of the pelvic gland and the sperm into her cloaca, stores them uh, in a structure that is called a spermatheca. That's homologous to the male pelvic gland. Uh, she stores them. Ultimately, the eggs come down, she's fer they're fertilized, and she releases them into the uh, water. So salamanders are all, well, almost all, oviparous. So they're characterized by being oviparous, whereas most of potents are viviparous or ovoviviparous. Uh, salamanders, most of them do have aquatic larval stages, tadpoles, but some of them are correct. For the anurans, uh, internal fertilization is quite rare. Uh, intromittent organ only in escapus, and uh, the other ones, the few other ones, do cloacal acquisition. So most of them are oviparous. Most have aquatic larvae. Uh, direct development occurs, but it is rare in those groups. Any questions? Okay. All right. So we're going to continue on looking at characteristics of amphibians. Uh, we'll look at the vocalizations and breathing and, and a few other things, and then we're going to get into metamorphosis. And I probably won't finish all of metamorphosis today, uh, but I'll be able to get some of it done. Okay. So if we look at vocalizations, you know, you had to know the the frog and toad calls, and most of you did quite well on those. <clears throat> uh, vocalizations are really limited in the apotens and the uridels, so they're, they're very common in the frogs and toads, the urines, but very limited in the other groups of amphibians. They just don't communicate much by the use of sound. We do have a new structure that appears in the amphibians and is best developed in the endurance, and that is a larynx. So you have that tube that's coming down from the oral cavity, the mouth region, the buccal cavity, whatever you want to call it, down to the lungs. And we're going to expand a portion of that and support it by little pieces of cartilage. And that's all the larynx is. It's a cartilaginous supported box in between the mouth cavity and the lungs themselves. Right. We stretch a couple of uh, thin bands of tissue across them, and those are our vocal cords. So you might have something like this. Right. 
Whereas these right here on either side, these would be the vocal cords. So they're not thin bands of thread that uh, are stretched across. They're actually like little flaps that stick out from either side. It's the vibration then of those vocal cords, air passing over them, vibrates them, and makes a sound that we hear coming out of the frog. Right. Now, both males and females have vocal cords, but they're better developed in the males, as you might expect. In addition, and urines have vocal sacs. Vocal sacs are present only in males. And so males have got the better developed uh, vocal cords and they have these vocal sacs. And what a vocal sac is, is simply an outgrowth, uh, yeah, an outgrowth of the buccal cavity. So you have this handout and way down in the corner is just a, a little diagram of the outline of a frog. And you can see where the vocal sac is. So you have the nostril, that's open to the atmosphere. Air would come in through that, into the buccal cavity, down into the lungs, through the larynx. But then we have this vocal sac, a thin wall of vocal sac that is below the mouth region of this animal. So what's going to occur is that the vocalization, the sounds that you had to learn are going to be created by the animal having air in its lungs. It's going to force that air out of its lungs through the larynx, vibrating the vocal cords. He keeps his nostril shut though. The sound is not emitted through an open mouth or through the nostrils. Instead, that air coming out of his lungs expands that vocal sac. And it's that vocal sac that is vibrating and sent, actually sending that sound out into the environment. And I just got a real short video if everything works fine. much more my video. Uh, once again, I copied something in newer Word and it won't open. We can see if I can find it. Oh, I, I'm just searching the web now. I, I had one all picked out, and uh, that'll work. Uh, this one doesn't talk too much, but.
This one's not as good, but you'll get the idea. The other one had three uh, species. Oh, God. So how do I do that? All right, well. How to waste time in class. Can't you go back into your history and find it? No, because I'm doing it on my computer on my desk. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, the idea was to show you the vocal sac in action. And uh, it, it is kind of cool to watch. Uh, you'll see this thing expand. It expands many times the size of the head of the animal. And that does a, a couple of things. This mode of producing the sound does a couple of things for the frog. One, it can increase the calling rate because the air is not expelled. It doesn't go out to the atmosphere. Instead, that air can be recycled. It can go back and forth between the vocal sacs and the lungs and therefore shove back over the uh, vocal cords repeatedly. Right? So it increases the calling rate because it does not have to do a laborious inhale every single time. The other thing that it does when you see these things expand is they're somewhat hemispherical. And that makes for a more omnidirectional, not omnidirectional, yeah, omnidirectional sound. So instead of beaming the sound out through the mouth or out through the nose, strictly in front of the animal, you have the surface of this vocal sac sending it out in all directions. So it's a more effective way of communicating to any ladies in the area that you're there and, and you're looking for them. So it's a, it is a unique setup uh, among our terrestrial birdlets, and I don't think I need that anymore. All right, if you're going to make sound, you have to be able to receive sounds. And so what you find is a new adaptation for detecting sounds in the amphibians. If you are an aquatic animal, like a fish, you make a sound or you hear a sound, that sound is traveling through the pond water. It's going to come to your body. And your cells are made up mostly of water. It's then going to come to the inner ear, which has fluid in it, similar to water. The vibrations then are coming through the pond water. They pass directly through the body wall of the animal, directly to the inner ear. And then you have the so-called hair cells, or neuromasts, inside that are going to be bent by that vibration coming through the water. And then the brain of the fish will interpret that as sound. When you come out onto land, you have a problem, because the air is very, uh, it's less dense. The sound waves are not as energetic. And when they pass through the air and come to an animal's body, they're going to bounce off. They're going to be reflected because the composition of the body is not the same as the comp 